From We Are Spectacular, this is a Spectacular Marketing Podcast. A podcast about everything brand, marketing, digital and social for the food and drink industry and beyond. Today I find myself down in Southwark Bridge Road. And any of you that know that area, there's a fantastic newish venue called Great Guns Social. And it's a fantastic space with actually a pop-up restaurant ready for any residency to come and take over. The latest residency that Great Gun Social has is with Chef Jay Morjaria. For those of you that know him, Jay has been championing vegetarian and vegan eating, plant forward as he calls it, for the last few years. And also we discover that it's really in his DNA and has been as part of his upbringing from an Indian background. But he's also been so curious about Korean food and what the Far East does with ingredients like plants to make it a meal rather than a side. I spent a fantastic hour, which just wasn't long enough with Jay, talking about the plant forward movement, talking about vegetarianism and veganism, also some shameless plugs for Great Gun Social and his latest pop-up, some really exciting things on the horizon for him as well in terms of publishing and different things. But we really get to the heart of the vegan and vegetarian agenda, what you could do for your business to add that to the mix of your menus and your offering and also how to go about that. I really, really enjoyed catching up with Jay. I hope you enjoy this episode and I'll speak to you soon. So it's a warm welcome to Chef. Chef <laughs> I, is the right well, answer. That's how I've got you in my phone, right? I've got you Chef Jay. Have you got me down as I've got Chef Jay in my phone. <laughs> so a warm welcome to Chef Jay Morjaria, mm. um, which sounds good with a Scottish accent, I think. It does sound It sounds much better with a Scottish accent. I'm going to say it with a Scottish accent. From now. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it's a warm welcome to, to Chef Jay. Yeah. Um, and Jake sort of came into my life, crossed paths. I guess, I don't know, it's like October, Pan- November last year. Last year, we were like a that. panel together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think we, yeah, we just kind of had it off yeah. and had a good chat. And I think, you know, for me, certainly, you know, I was just so fascinated by what you had to say because I almost wasn't thinking there were enough people like you existing in terms of, <laughs> you know, really championing the plant forward movement, yeah. really championing, you know, also the, the Far Eastern side of things and not the cliched ones, you know, the more yeah. interesting ones, which I'm sure you'll talk about as well. And also some great success at the moment um, at Great Guns Social. Um, it's going great guns. Quite it's going great guns, quite literally. literally. Yeah. Um, So where is that exactly? So that's in Southwark, uh, and we started about uh, a few weeks back, and, you know, right now we're kind of into a third week, um, and it is really, I mean, it's going really well. We're getting booked out on Thursday nights, Friday nights at the moment, uh, really busy, and, you know, Tuesday and Wednesdays historically are really difficult in the industry, and they're kind of getting booked out as well. So we're starting to get reviews in. From people who are coming in and you know we're getting good reviews good. and that's you know I guess as a chef so if I put my chef hat on for a bit that's all I want to do mm. all I want to do is cook for people make nice food and then just get people to say nice things about it yeah that's it and um, and if that happens then everything else just rolls on doesn't yeah. it yeah. I think you know that's what people forget mm. you know especially in the the fast casual dining mm. sector it's all about process and then it's marketing to drive sales yeah. but really fundamentally if you used to have great service great environment yeah. great food that does you know that does surely itself. you could tick those boxes yeah and then the marketing and everything else will come it might put you, it might put you out of a job that's okay. for a bit that's okay <laughs> <laughs> it does mean that you know i think you've got to have certain goals and you've got to have that horizon which is I just want to cook, you know, one mm. person does this, I want to cook great food. Mm. And then the other person is like coming in from a marketing point of view and saying, I just want to make sure that that gets talked about. Yeah. You know, and if you just put those two worlds together, actually it's not, this is not a difficult game to be in. Yeah. I, th- I think it's at scale yeah. is where the issues lie. Yeah. You know, 
where you know people in your organisation maybe only care six out of ten, yeah, five out of ten. You know, it's not really what they might want to be doing. Whereas if you are chef owner. Mm. You know, and it's and it's coming from you. Then it's going to be ten, eleven, twelve yeah. out of ten. You know, you're going to give it your all. So it, it is a real difficult one. But you are pleasing people one plate at a time, yeah. as in cooking it as if it's your last, I suppose. Yeah. Whereas you're only as good as your last, yeah. plate of food. Exactly, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. You only look as good as your last meal. Yeah. Whereas actually, if you've got a process in place and you're a, you're a you know high street brand mass, yeah. and I've done that as well. Yeah, yeah. You know. And gone through that process as a consultant. Yeah, the whole it's you kind of become. I mean, I, I don't want to say you become lazy because that means that it's a little bit of a generalization. But mm. you have the, um, you know, you have the capacity to become a little bit lazy. <clears throat> Your life doesn't depend on it. No, you know, you could put a process in place and just recreate that process throughout each single store. Yeah, <clears throat> going through you know a hundred stores. Yeah. And it'll be the same every single time. Yeah, yeah. And then you just got to keep the consistency of that. Yeah. And that's it. And you make changes and small changes here and there. Yeah. yeah. And you make seasonal changes here and there. And it works. Yeah. You know, it works as a formula. And and again, humans and as consumers, we're creatures of habit. Yeah. You know, we will go into the store and eight times out of ten, we will choose the same sandwich, same, thing. same coffee, same thing. Because we don't have time to make new decisions. Yeah. Or risk that amount of money, risk, you know. And yeah. I remember, you know, years ago, I went to a, one of these conference things, you know, yeah. Peach or whatever. And um, yeah, there was the, there was the, it was quite humbling actually. The, the CEO of M- Mitchell's and Butler, the big mm. pub group, was on the stage, and he was saying, "It's all very well, all us people who, you know, we make more than the average wage, I would assume. Mm. You know, most people listening, I hope, you know, but basically." He then said, but what if your choice was going out for a meal with your family or buying a pair of football boots for your kid? Yeah. You can't fuck it up. No, you can't. You know? You really can't. And even at that level, there is an £8 meal Mm. for two kids. Mm. You know, that was the difference. You know, whether the kid will fit in at school because they've got the right boots. Yeah. Or, you know, going out for dinner that, you know, could be... You know, it's a mediocre. Yeah, exactly. So, so I think this is the thing, isn't it? We, you know, time and money, it's still as important as they've ever had yeah, been yeah. and probably getting more important. So, yeah, yeah. and when it comes to food, um, even the big boys out there mm. don't want to mess around with the formula too much. No. You know, they're not going to go completely left field. Yeah, yeah. You know, I could do that in a single establishment. Yeah. But when I'm consulting for someone who's got five stores and they want to make a change mm. on their menu... You can't go massively left field because yeah, yeah. it won't go down very well. Yeah. And at the, but at the same time, having said that, people still want newness. People yeah. still want to be on trend. Yeah. Even if the trend is something completely stupidly ridiculous, yeah. they still want to be on trend. Well, but so, you want a watered down version of that trend. It's something, yeah, that you're right. And I think sometimes it's even the signaling from that restaurant or takeaway shop or whatever it is that the options there, mm. that then they think at least so-and-so's menu has changed. Yeah. They might not go for it, yeah. but at least, you know, it's, it's a cool thing. Yeah. But what I was fascinated by, you know, we've got a whole bunch of questions and yeah. not we'll enough time, probably. <laughs> well, just before we nip into, you know, some maybe some more detailed stuff and also talking more about Great Guns, um, I, you know, actually a, a quick nip through your how you got here yeah. would be interesting because it Let's wasn't traditional. No, it's not traditional. So, um, well, actually, in a way, it kind of is. Um, my dad and mum started a business. My dad started a business um, back in early 70s, and it was uh, a fruit and veg business. Mm. So uh, it, the journey you'll see is actually kind of a little bit 360 mm. in the sense that um, my dad started out in the 70s, um, literally kind of peddling fruit and veg to people in his area yeah. who were Indian yeah. and they wanted Indian fruit and veg. They wanted fruit and veg that they were used to back in Kenya where he came from. Yeah. So he came in the, he came in the 60s and, and then uh, got here, worked in different factories and stuff like that and then just started kind of buying fruit and veg 
skimming stuff off a car- cargo in terms of like just buy all well, I'll buy about 100 pounds worth here yeah and then I'll try and peddle it to people I knew he did that and then he quite quickly through the 70s and then in the 80s by kind of mid 80s he was um, the number two supplier of exotic fruit and veg in the in London Whoa. probably up to the Midlands in that sense and so he was selling okra and bitter melon and aubergines and chilies to people who knew what it was yeah. but actually most people didn't know what it was yeah. at Christmas because lychees were in season my dad to keep everyone happy around the area in, on our street because he had, a, he had by that time he had accumulated a couple of properties yeah. we lived in the middle one single door <clears throat> that ended up being a little bit of a TARDIS house right. but uh, surrounded by an off license and a different shop and he'd run all those shops right, right. so he was you know, in that area, he was kind of doing really well as a businessman. It was an old dairy farm, that old dairy, yeah. that he'd kind of ended up slowly kind of buying each one. Um, and when property prices was 15K in the yeah. 70s, 80s, it was like, you know, think about it. It's a lot of money then. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So you had to work hard for it. But yeah. he worked, you know, from a barrel boy, almost like, you know, like wheelbarrowing kind of. Yeah, yeah, um, stuff for So anyway, so by the 80s, he'd done that and then, and people didn't even know what chilies were, or well, not chilies, but I mean, didn't people didn't like see aubergines, you know, yeah, the way they are now, let alone a you know emoji. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? Now it's an emoji. Short My dad, hand for, do you yeah. know it's an emoji? And it doesn't mean an aubergine. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, he's like, so you know, he did that, and then it, so and then he went into restaurants. So basically, he was buying the fruit and veg. Mm. He's like, well, I'm going to open a, I'm opening a green grocery. That sells all this stuff. So he's opening green grocery. And the building next door came up for sale. So he took that and then went, I'm going to open a restaurant here. So he had the entire... At one point, he inter- owned the entire chain. <laughs> Clever. Because he's only negotiating with himself, right? He's only negotiating with himself. All he has to do... He literally was buying it pre, pre-cost. pre Right, right. Before he sells it to fruit and veg to wholesalers. Do you see what I mean? So anyway, so I grew up around fruit and veg yeah. in the 70s, growing up, 80s. And then restaurants from... 80s onwards, mid 80s onwards to 90s, and then you know, and so that's kind of where my and it was a vegetarian rest, a couple of vegetarian restaurants that he had, which again back in those days it was misunderstood, you know, wafer thin ham. Can you have that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, well, stuff. wafer of thin yeah. ham? Um, <laughs> so yeah, it wasn't you know it was this is what it was. I mean, but it was an Indian restaurant, yeah. So it, it was easier to do kind of Indian food vegetarian. But there weren't many around still, even Indian vegetarian restaurants, even in West London, where we were, where I was born and, and, and raised. And so even then it was like, this is the, kind of the first vegetarian Indian restaurant yeah, yeah. that had come up in, you know, that area, it was second even. So it was, he was kind of pioneering at that time uh, in, a, in, a, in a lot of ways. What was um, it? What was it called? Um, Ashna. Okay. Yeah. So I think it means kind of warm welcome. Ooh. Family run. You had like, you know, me and my brother walking around like monkey butlers, you know, serving food to people yeah, at yeah. the age of, you know, <laughs> the age we were then. And, um, and it was incredible. We kind of lived in this restaurant, worked in this restaurant. But it's and, real work. And it, I think it gives you that work ethic. Yeah, it really does. And then the great thing about it was that it kind of set a foundation for this love of deep love of food and this real um, understanding, even though we weren't vegetarian, Understanding of vegetarian food because my mom was vegetarian, is vegetarian, and um, so she would be doing a lot of the cooking, a lot of her recipes. <clears throat> we picked up a lot of recipes from, you know, northern India, mm. south, um, Mumbai street food. Yeah. We're doing Mumbai street food before, you know, a lot of the people now doing Mumbai street food. We were doing it then yeah. and doing it well. Yeah. So um, anyway, so that's my background. That's how. So I've always been in food or furniture or, or, or food or you know. Um, restaurants or vegetables at some point. But then you went a bit commercial. So yes, yeah, so I went completely there? commercial for 15 years. Oh. So I went into retail, but via furniture design. Mm. So I did furniture design and then went into retail. Uh, so I was kind of doing part designing, part buyer for some quite big brands and designing furniture for them. And then I kind of went into straight buying for a big, a big supermarket. So you were a hard ass. I was a hard ass, <laughs> and I learned to negotiate. If I didn't learn to negotiate from my dad and listening to him negotiating pence on boxes of chilies, 
it was negotiating yeah. for the big T. So, you know, that was that really kind of set a foundation for me because mm. it became I became a businessman almost not a businessman but yeah, yeah. you know very commercial and it was easy to go into business after yeah, that. Yeah. Then I left all of that behind. But in that time, what actually happened was that in that 15 years, I ended up traveling loads to Asia. And I ended up getting exposed to, you know, ground, ground on, like, ground zero Asian food, mm-hmm. Chinese food in China, mm-hmm. you know, in Shenzhen, in Guangdong, mm-hmm. those areas. So I was, in the background, I was always constantly getting exposed to it. Yeah. Um, and then it kind of leads on to, you know, and then I left, I left uh, the, the supermarket and then I went on to um, Open Sutra Kitchen and that was the first vegetarian vegan cooking school in central London and that was just down the road in Carnaby Street so yeah, yeah. and um, that was a really great experience we did that for three years yeah. uh, before we had to kind of move out before they turned everything into restaurants mm. and we weren't ready to become a restaurant from a cooking school mm-hmm. but we had such a great experience there because we had the, we were ahead of the curve um, in terms of if that was seven years ago, mm. roughly, maybe six years ago, mm. imagine how many vegetarians, vegans there were then. A lot of vegetarians and a lot of flexitarians almost, but mm. hardly any vegans. Yeah. And, you know, that trend has only just happened in the last two years, yeah. three years. So we were ahead of it. We were mostly getting carnivores coming in, cooking, wanted to cook for their girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> And do you know what's really weird is that I, I only figured this out when I looked through the questions and I thought, like an anecdote or something like that from yeah. the Sutra. And one of the things that I found was that um, we had a lot of butchers' daughters and farmers' daughters, you know, daughters of people who were in professions where they were heavily involved in farming or butchery or abattoir, you know, like that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So very kind of meat in the meat industry. Yeah. And it was that kind of sensitive side of it. Like, I just... I, it's a reaction against it. So, yeah, we had that. And then we also had, like, um, Saudi princesses coming in. Wow. Yeah, to, to learn to cook who actually never cooked. <laughs> <laughs> never cooked in their life. It was really weird. And then you married a Saudi princess. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, a princess. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Yeah, I mean, that was Sutra, and it was a great few years, and then I kind of left that behind, and actually consulting was starting to take over mm. uh, while I was at Sutra. So how did that happen? Had people... People just found me, yeah, and they wanted... Um, they started to see the trend in vegan and vegetarian, mm. and at the time I was myself as well. Mm-hmm. So it was very easy to just to kind of go in and work with people like TRG and some kind of big names yeah. to start consulting on... Gluten free, allergy free, and what sort of brands in TLG then was it like? It was across the chain, or it so it was um, just developing a load of recipes for them mm. from the chain, yeah. And then there was other other brands that I worked with, and what was really cool about that was that I was starting to kind of go into this realm that the knowledge I had, and it was all in the background. You know, like when you have this kind of subconscious knowledge that's mm-hmm. just sitting there in the background, and it only starts to make sense or you only start to use it and tap into it like a resource that you've had historically but you never really appreciate it at the time well it's also you think why do other people not know this do they not know this too yeah and then operationally do you not know this yeah but actually i always always in restaurants but i never really appreciated it i never i kind of took advantage it was a social hangout for me for my friends locally yeah you know in that area in hounslow in West London, it was like, oh, yeah, my mates, I'll just come along, just sit down, have a meal. I'll just throw you a quick, you know, yep. pilpery or, you know, <laughs> something like that. And um, I can say pilpery now because everyone knows what a pilpery yeah, is. True. But back then, <laughs> I couldn't have said that. Um, but, um, you know, it was kind of a social hangout for me. And then, But now when I'm working with restaurants, I'm like, yeah, now I'm developing recipes and things like that. And operationally, I'm working with more restaurants and trying to create brands from startup. Mm-hmm. So working with those brands um, who just come to me with a concept. I mean, they've never worked in the restaurant industry. They've never worked in hospitality. Mm-hmm. They've just got an idea mm-hmm. or money. Mm-hmm. Um, 
sometimes no idea and money. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's quite common because I think, you know, food and drink has become rock and roll. It's rock and roll. And, and we get phone calls all the time where, you know, it is an ex-banker that's look, almost yeah. looking for a hobby. Um, and then you're just kind of, th- you know, I, I'm honestly advising them and going... I'm not sure you should go into it too blind. You yeah. know, maybe work in. Yeah, go get get some yeah. real experience. See if you really want to do this mm-hmm. because it isn't a holiday. If you've got money in your bank and you've done all right for a mm-hmm. bit, it's okay. Mm-hmm. Like go and do a stage in a restaurant. Mm-hmm. Go and work in hospitality. Mm-hmm. Go and understand front of house. Yeah. Just doesn't matter. Be a waiter. Yeah. yeah. Whatever you need to do to understand it a little bit better than you do right now yeah. as a consumer. Yeah. Because you can't go into this industry uh, without, uh, just as a consumer, you have to go in mm. having something under your belt. Mm. And that doesn't, you don't have to have accolades or you know, awards or you don't have to have certificates and all this kind of stuff. You don't need to go and do a huge culinary course yeah. and call yourself a chef. You yeah. don't need to do that. Just go and understand it better than you do right now. Yeah. Because don't try and create a restaurant just because I like eating out or, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. It's, and not it's the biggest bugbear for me mm-hmm. that happened when I was doing consultancy is, was that. But as a marketeer, mm-hmm. I can imagine for you, consumer, mm-hmm. being a consumer is the best thing. Because you need to see it from that side. You don't need to see it from that side. No. You need to see it from the, you need someone from that side to tell you this is my idea, so so wrong. and I need to see and see it through a consumer eyes, which is, and I'm not saying I'm not taking away from what you do. No, 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 you no. do an amazing and a spectacular job, but um, you know there are very few people who can put on consumer glasses and um, know the know. other side. Yeah, because it's, it's really tricky. Like you know, a lot of people ask us all the time. They go like would you not like to open a restaurant? Or yeah. And I'm like, no way, yeah. man. Like, I like eating out. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and definitely. And I, I, I just see how how tricky it is. You know, it's yeah. a real a real difficult one. And I think, you know, given the next two years, I think it's going to be a very different landscape yeah. out there. You know, you're going to see a lot of concepts going. You're going to see a lot of concepts having to change. And, yeah. and as you say, you know, that militant veganism which you know almost seem like a, a harsh choice mm-hmm. in terms of what you would you would eat plus the options weren't there I mean it's just an absolute wave of people just completely changing and it's a pleasure to eat vegan now really because is. there's so many things you can have yeah I don't know why for so long people just I mean I, I get I actually understand why people thought vegan food mm was what it was mm. um, because it was mm. it was it was just like you know it was like it was not great and even now completely honestly mm. you know I'm just kind of there are there are people out there right now I admire very much um, and there are people that I um, think that could do a better job yeah you know the, the, the problem I have with vegan food currently is that it could be better, you know, in places. Mm. I'm not saying everyone. There are things that are like, people will say, oh, this is great, this is great. But actually, is it, is it, it's great compared to what? Mm. You know, is it great compared to that amazing restaurant around the corner who might have 10 meat dishes and have a couple of vegan dishes on there? But actually, those vegan dishes are superb yeah. because that chef is superb and they can understand that vegetable or how what to do with it yeah. you know and unless and if you're a hot, entirely vegan entire vegan business and actually you're just doing 10 things on a menu and eight not very well mm. and two great mm. is that good food mm. you know i don't necessarily completely agree with that but you know it's it's just it, you know again with food it's so subjective isn't it everything what? is personal and everything's subjective well, i think it's what's your frame of reference you know so for a lot of people who are you know getting into you know vegan diets and vegan Mm. eating or or being flexible with it there's not a huge frame of reference yet so it'll be really interesting as you say 
in the next couple of years as people try more and more and more different types of high end yeah. grab and go, yeah. you know, and then they start to calibrate and say, oh, that's what good vegan foods are. Because yeah. I think people are understanding good vegetarian. Mm. But, you know, we'll come on to this, mm. but things like, um, you know, the, the, the protein alternatives, right? Mm. So, um, I never know how to say this. Is it Satan? Satan? Yeah, Satan. Satan. Yeah. So, um, you know, things like that. I, I think people are having it, yeah. but a lot of the time they're trialing it and they yeah. don't know if it's good or bad or yeah. indifferent. Or, I, don't, you know. I, can't, I can't digest it very well. Yeah. Because it's pure gluten. Yeah. And I can't. You know, I, I, it affects me, so I don't. Yeah. I don't necessarily eat it that much. Yeah. I don't like eating it. So, you know, it's not for everyone. If, if everyone moved to a seitan diet, or, you know, you know that kind of diet, or tempeh or whatever, eating more mm. soy and mm. you know gluten, is that really like massively good for us? I don't know. Like, I don't know that. I don't know the science behind it. I don't know the stats behind it, so I can't really comment on it. But, you know, I I can't. I can't take a lot of gluten, so I won't eat seitan yeah. that much. Like, I'll try it if yeah. it's worth trying. I mean, there are people who are doing great stuff with seitan, yeah, yeah. but you know, it's just there's a lot of it's just a lot of mac and cheese and you know things like that out yeah. there. And I'm yeah. like, we can move away and make vegan food interesting yeah. and take it up a level. Yeah. And that's why I like working with plants. That's why I like working with just vegetables sometimes. Mm. You know, I won't, I don't put mock stuff on my menu. I don't try and take something and manufacture it into something that looks like me, as it were. Not always. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you can do, sometimes you do that, but you do it in a clever way. You know, we do a, a couple of things where in, 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 in the restaurant where if we do something in, with meat, mm. or if we do something vegan, then we'll try and do a meat version of it. Yeah. You know, we'll kind of flip it. Flip it. So, and we only have two options anyway. So, and they have M next to it or mm. F next to it if it's fish or meat. So we flip that yeah. whole script and on vegan food or being the lowest common denominator in a menu yeah. and only having two options. They are the exception. They're the exception. Yeah. So our, if we have 15 dishes on the menu, 12 of them will be vegan. Yeah. Or, <clears throat> and one will be vegetarian. Yeah. So one will be cheese, yeah, because I still love cheese, and um, you know the other two left over after that is meat or fish. Because you know when we ate at your your pop up mm. um, at Great Guns, I was with my friend Adam, mm. and um, and Adam's Jewish, mm. so he just basically ordered for us, and you, mm. you came up and mm. he just said, "We'll have everything except the meat," mm. but he was only thinking about the pork. Yeah, and at the end of the night, a lady it. came up to me and went, "Yeah." Did you have the lamb? And I was like, "What lamb?" <laughs> I didn't like it's absolutely it. raging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but um, I mean, God, we, we had to pull two. I mean, what you brought out and all your kindness, like we had to pull two tables together <laughs> for like all the plates that were coming yeah. out. I mean, it was just like I mean, it's it's like you would never imagined. And yeah. you know, me being a larger Scotsman, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, brought up on beige things yeah, and, yeah. and meat. Then you know. When we were coming to see you, you know, there was a little bit of trepidation yeah. going, huh, tonight I'm going to a plant forward concert. Yeah. Glaswegians, certainly me, famously, yeah. you know, not into salad. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean I could have I could have deep fried the salad for you if you want me to. <laughs> yeah. So I mean you somehow. Know, from, <laughs> but from from that point of view, I was just like, you know, and was it they say chips is Glasgow yeah. salad? So um <laughs> But yeah, I mean, we, I mean, we had a fabulous evening. It was Thank absolutely you. amazing, and um, we're also lucky enough to meet a girl who is a producer for Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen yeah, Nightmares. Yeah, 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 yeah. So she was fascinating. Yeah, so she was fascinating. it was what was nice was like people got together yeah. as well. We yeah. all the tables started talking to each other. Yeah. You had some family there, maybe. <clears throat> I had family so, there, and, yeah. some, and obviously, yeah, friends there as well. So was, what's really nice yeah. is that kind of very convivial atmosphere, and I really like it, and it yeah. kind of creates a great vibe. And I think just back to the food part of it, mm. you know, outside Great Guns, um, this whole, you know, yes, there's a community mm -hmm. happening. And I'm probably on the edge of that community, because, you know still kind of dabbling in me and mm. what have you. It's just like, I just feel that um, 
in terms of the, the, the menu that we got at Great Guns um, and the, the way I've worked in all the supper clubs and the, since I've kind of stopped consultancy, or not stopped it, but I kind of toned down the consultancy mm. side of it because I really wanted to concentrate on Dynasty mm. and Dynasty as a brand and getting it to a point where it's a permanent, permanent fixture. So you kind of have to do the pop-ups and, you know, get all the hype up. Yeah. Because one thing I have noticed that you could open a restaurant from zero followers. If you've got the money, you can get to bums on the seats and, you know. Mm-hmm. But if you don't have, you need the hype, you need the marketing, you need the social media mm-hmm. behind it, at least nowadays anyway, yeah, yeah. to rise above everything else. So I figured that, you know what, I'm going to take on less on the consultancy. I'm going to make less money. Fine. But I really need to get this brand out there. Mm. And I really need to get this kind of um, concept of uh, this plant curious or plant forward with a little bit of meat on the side. And because I love East Asian food, because of traveling and, and spending a bit... I went, so I went to Korea a few, three years ago and um, <clears throat> spent quite a lot of time out in Korea because I was really curious about Korean food and I was like, I really love eating it, but I'm not going to start cooking it or teaching people how to make Korean food if I'm not, if I haven't been out there mm. and worked and learned mm. how to cook it properly. Mm. I probably didn't even spend anywhere near as much time as a lot of people spend, but I did spend enough time out there, yeah. I think. And so I came back with kind of all the flavors, all the things in my head came back and started cooking more Korean, more Japanese food. Since then, I've kind of, you know, done a lot of work with the Korean embassy and, you know, um, and now next week I'm working with the Japanese embassy. So, you know, kind of pushing Japanese and Korean ingredients Mm. forward in a much more modern way. Mm. And I think the whole vegan thing is just kind of sitting there in the background. And it's never really, I've never really thought about it because I'm just taking ingredients and I'm just making them interesting. And mm. you s- start to slap on miso onto something or dang jang or gochujang onto something or so soybean paste and, you know, spice and all those flavors. Actually, it's not a vegetable anymore. It's just an interesting plate of food. Mm-hmm. So I really wanted to push that whole, whole kind of philosophy over the year. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, for the last year, that's what I've been doing. Supper clubs, events, you know, residencies, pop-ups. And... You know, truthfully, it's a slog. Yeah. But, um, and it's, you know, consulting five, six days a month and getting a decent wage for it, you look back and you go, well, that was easy. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> let me do something more difficult. Yeah. <clears throat> because, excuse me, because what I did when I, when I started Sutra, I'd left a great job. Yeah. You know, lifestyle, just moved into a new house, just had a kid. Oh yeah, I'll just leave. I'm just going to leave my job now. Is that all right? Sounds familiar. <laughs> You've done exactly the same. <laughs> leave everything and start a business. Yeah. And I'm like, and start a business that in a time where people didn't really understand what vegan was. Yeah. Um, just people are just getting their heads around vegetarian. You know, Mildred's was around the corner, mm. and that was it. Yeah. There wasn't a veggie prep. But pe- people must have thought you were nuts, right? Yeah, completely nuts. My, I think my parents thought I was nuts. My Mrs. thought I was nuts. Everyone thought I was nuts. Yeah. Right? My, um, my co-workers were like, yeah, great, we really support you, Jay. We'll support you. We'll but we'll see you, in, we'll see you in six months. We'll yeah. see you back. back yeah? Yeah. Don't worry, your job's here. Yeah, yeah. Which is a nice fallback. <laughs> Which is nice. Position. It's always nice to know that there's a job waiting for you. I think yeah. that job's still waiting for me. <laughs> <laughs> Seven years on. I think you'll be all right. I think, <clears throat> yeah, I think but, I'll be fine. But I think the whole thing is, you know, you're an entrepreneur, right? And, and there's something in you that, there is the easy life yeah. with the money and the pension and the healthcare, yeah. and yeah. it would be fine. But man, you'd be bored. Oh God, you'd I'd be, be looking so at that bored. clock, just going, oh, just you know, driving whatever car you're driving with a fancy watch and whatever, just yeah. going. I'm not happy. Fundamentally, yeah. not happy. You know. I, I I've seen a lot of um, chefs go. I mean, I actually probably had this realization again a year ago, where I was like, all I strive for. And I think probably what I've been striving for, <clears throat> apart from just owning my own business, was to... I realise I miss cooking for people. Yeah. When we used to do, at Sutra, we used to do these nights or kitchen parties. The Sutra kitchen party, because that's where the party's always in the kitchen. Yeah, true. So, um, 
we did this night school suture kitchen parties, we just opened up the kitchen, I used to cook. And we used to do supper clubs back then, when supper clubs weren't really cool then. And um, I, um, I just realised I loved cooking. Yeah. And I missed it. Mm. I missed cooking for people, and I did this stint in Korea. I, I loved cooking for people, yeah. even though they were like, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> Got shouted at in Korean a lot. <laughs> you know, tables banging, pots banging. Yeah. You know, you know, they're trying, telling me, well, why, why are you not understanding what I'm saying? Like, because don't speak your language. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to learn. <laughs> but, uh, you know, in terms of Korea then, that's a scary thought, right? So, how did you even go about that? Did you just get on a plane? Yeah, I literally, I, I literally went on a travel site, booked my ticket, did a bit of research into where I should be going. <clears throat> you know, learned to make, excuse me. That's oh, right. <clears throat> learned to make bipping baps in the town where it's supposed to be made, mm. where they come from. Went to Seoul, went to culinary school in Seoul, and then um, kind of worked in little spots that they linked me up with and, you know, it just kind of naturally flowed, but it was essentially as much as getting, starting with one point yeah. of reference, getting on a plane, mm. getting myself somewhere to stay, and then just going out there and going, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it properly. Yeah. You know? It sounds very familiar. I was at the the Brighton uh, Best Restaurant Awards on, mm. on Monday night, and Bencho Yakitori, mm. which is you know now got a little bit of fame down there, <clears throat> or a big bit of fame actually. Um, he David became second in the best restaurant, so mm. just phenomenal, phenomenal result. I think for the second year running, and he did this similar to you. So he went out to Japan, and yeah, a similar thing. You're just thinking mm. so scary, and he was saying things like, "What well, I was talking to him, and he was like, wasn't even allowed to look at the fish, basically." You know, it was just, you're Western, yeah. therefore, you don't get near the good stuff. You do the other stuff. Yeah, do the prep. Cut the spring onions. All that. <clears throat> I don't know how many spring onions I cut. <laughs> and, then, and he also said he wasn't allowed to take notes in the yeah. kitchen. He had to had yeah. to know all in his head, you know. He had to be. Just, you know, really, I think he ended up doing about four years out there. Yeah, you had to, I had to watch. I wasn't allowed to make the stews. Mm. Um... And I wasn't allowed to make the rice. Right. I was like, I know how to make rice. You don't know how to make rice. You don't know how to make rice like we make rice. Mm. And I and I realised I didn't. Right. So I didn't know, know how to make rice. So what was like? The- I knew how to make rice. I knew how to make. I know how to make Thai jasmine rice. I know how to make sushi rice. And I, you know, I know how to make. I thought I knew how to make. You know, a really good sticky rice or rice, but I didn't know how to make rice like the Koreans. Right. You know, like it was just. There was just something in the way they did it. Right. You know, the way it was put into these... Um, some Everyone did it kind of slightly differently. Some people would just be rice cooker, you know, because it was like a quick hot yeah, service yeah. restaurant. Some of the smaller places would do it. They would put it into... They'd make it um, so it's just cooked, and then they'd put it into this little pot, small pot, individual yeah, yeah, pot, yeah. and sometimes had bean, red beans in it, and they would cover it, and it would leave it, and it was steam in the pot. Yeah. And you'd never think to kind of individualise it and then yeah. leave it and then cook it. Let it carry on cooking in its own heat. And it would be ready when the customers walk in for lunch. <clears throat> so I, I thought I knew. Yeah, yeah. And you like, I didn't know. And I always say to people, like, I'm training someone up at the moment. And, you know, he's kind of, he's never actually really cooked. He's never, he didn't know what miso was until three weeks ago. He didn't know what any of the Korean ingredients are. Mm. Three weeks on, he's like literally reciting the recipes to me. Brilliant. And saying, oh, we should do this. We should uh-huh. do this. And I'm like, that's so cool because yeah. he didn't know what it was. Yeah, yeah. You know? And he didn't have to get <laughs> on I, a plane. When I said to him, when I got... <laughs> um, but when I, I, I said to him, like, just forget everything you learned. Yeah. Forget it. Yeah. Forget you learned how to make um, pasta from Gennaro Contado. Forget yeah. that. Yeah. You know? You're learning to make dumplings from me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's this kind of. I don't know if you've seen Ugly Delicious yes. on Netflix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And honestly, I'm addicted. To it. <laughs> it's brilliant. I mean, I think David Chang is like an absolute hero of mine. But then when you put David Chang and Masoop Massimo Batura in the same room, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, having a dumpling off or a tortellini <laughs> off, 
<clears throat> that's like heaven to me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, yeah, it's almost like seeing your two famous wrestlers yeah, against yeah. each other, you know, exactly. something like that. Or, yeah. yeah, almost the Corner Earthquake, the corner Earthquake thing. and... Yeah. <laughs> Undertaker. <laughs> Showing my age. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Well, a, a couple other things, you know, I was thinking about was, um, you know, vegetarian food for everyone. You yeah. know, the cookbook launched in 2013. And, yeah, yeah what, what's sort of changed since then? And what do you think of that? I don't know how much of the vegetarian world has changed mm. since that book. I mean, I think there has. There's mm. a lot more nutrition involved in it. I think I probably just wrote that book from recipes that I'd had in my head at the time mm. or things that I'd grown up with or slightly adapted or liked eating. Yeah. It was a very, it's a very different book. If I was to write a book, cookbook now, it'd be totally different. Mm. A dynasty cookbook right now would be almost a completely different author. Right. You know, you see a pattern between every book an author does because they kind of do it and then there's not a long gap. So there's a little bit of a yeah. success. I every mean, unless you're Hairy Bikers, yeah. which every book is kind of slightly different yeah. anyway, but it's, yeah. there's a theme. Yeah. This one wouldn't even, they wouldn't even be comparable. Yeah. So for me, my world has changed massively yeah. just in those five years. But from that book point of view, I think it's still a reasonably relevant book. I think mm. there's recipes in there that people could really pick up now and, you know, use. Yeah. So... Is that something that's going to happen then? Are you, you got two, three, four, five more books in you? I would love to write more books. Yeah? Yeah, I'd really love to write. I mean, especially from a kind of East Asian point of view. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I really want to do is a travel program. <laughs> well, that would I'd be I'd love awesome. to do a travel program. Yeah, I think that would work brilliantly. Yeah. 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 That's, that's something I absolutely... I want to go back to Korea. Yeah, yeah. As a, as a kind of presenting Korea yeah. to people. Or presenting Japan to people. Um, and obviously, everything I would do, it wouldn't be completely meat-focused, but it would be, you know, there would be a massive plant mm. element to it. And actually, if you look at temple cuisine in Korea and you look at um, temple cuisine in, or, you know, shojin ryori in yeah. uh, Japan, it's vegan, vegan cuisine. Mm. So, you know, there are a lot of cultures in the world have got vegan, uh, vegan history or kind of, you know, vegetarian history to them. Not mm. just India. Mm. India is like, I mean, I, I, my ancestry is from Gujarat, which yeah. is a, a meat-free state, it's a dry state, yeah. which is, doesn't reflect me at all. <laughs> you, go to, you go to Gujarat, you can't drink. Any, right, right, no, right. The, the, none of the restaurants serve alcohol. Is there any moonshine or something? No, well, there probably there? is, yeah, actually. Right. I think it's pang or something like that, right. which is like a kind of, you know, it's, uh, it's only drank on certain days of the year yeah. um, uh, to celebrate a god's kind of birthday or existence or whatever yeah. and um, so yeah it's like a moonshine but you know it's um, I think one of the things that um, you were say- we were saying about cultures around the world mm. that have vegan food so I, I would love to pick up on that you know yeah. that kind of travel element of something so just going back to the book yes I'd love to write another book yeah. yes it would be very plant forward but not entirely yeah. kind of more of this an- another buzzword is flexitarian I th- which I think is how restaurants are going to be. Yeah, and, and I think what I um, really enjoyed you talking about was being plant curious and and meat meat being the exception. I think that's such a cool just flipping the V for an M yeah. Yeah. on a menu. It's and, a V and, for an M. And I think for you, I think again, what's so cool about what you're doing is you're not being you're not having exclusions, right? Mm-hmm. You're not going meets the devil you know, plants are everything, yeah. you know, it, there's that balance. And I think what it might do, not to get all too Buddhist on you or anything, but, <laughs> but I think it'll give you, I think it'll give people, if there's a little bit of great quality protein on the plate mm. with a predominantly plant plate yeah. of food, yeah. it, then I think it'll make you appreciate the meat that's on your plate yeah. more, wouldn't it? Yeah, if it, it was would. four great slices of amazing chicken or yeah, yeah. the best <clears> steak or... You know, and I think bringing back a bit of balance through flavours and taste and, yeah. you know, a bit more skill... Well, I the irony, really the irony is, in a plant-forward residency right now, um, the pork belly is a, is a bigger seller. Yeah. But, that, but there's a reason for that, because um, you've got a table of four, for example... Mm. 
and you've got two meat dishes, mm. they'll order that meat dish. If they want pork belly, they'll order it twice. But at the same time, they'll order every other veg- vegetable that's on the menu yeah. to accompany that. Yeah. And they won't miss... They walk away thinking, I've had some meat. Yeah. It was good. I really enjoyed it. But I also really enjoyed all oh, that cabbage with you know, black yeah. garlic miso on it. Yeah. So they will... They get it. Mm. And so people are understanding. And I never thought people were understanding because this is just some kind of crazy idea in my head. Yeah. But people are getting it. And I think maybe that's just because that's the way people are eating nowadays. Yeah. Possibly. I don't but, know. But I think what's interesting is from your, your father and you, know, and you, there seems to be a bit of pioneering DNA in the, in the <laughs> yeah, family. Probably. So I think you know, you're definitely right to trust your Nuts. gut. Nuts. Nuts. But <laughs> I think you've, you've been right. You've went to where the puck is before the puck's got there. Yeah, well, I, yeah. I mean, I and I, I don't always like trend. People go to me, oh, what's the next? What's the next big thing? Or what's the next? I'll trend just scratch that question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't ask me. Um, but I have been asked, and it's like I don't know. Yeah. But I can tell you that this is what people are talking about right now. Yeah. Or I feel this is what it's going to be. Mm. But I do genuinely feel that I think a lot of restaurants are just going to start cutting back on the meat. Mm putting more vegetables on the menu. Because mm. actually, I think, honestly, from a chef point of view, and this is very personal, and, and, and it's probably not reflective at all, at all across the chef industry, mm. but I think that it's really interesting working with uh, vegetables. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. It's fascinating. To, to bring out the flavour, make it feel like a meal, yeah. is rather than a side. And, you know, yeah. and all these types of things, I think, is difficult. Um, so a couple of... Uh, Last things, I, I think, then you'll need to skip through the snow and get yeah, a couple of tennis snow. rackets or something. <laughs> um, but, you know, just in terms of um, menu development then, mm. you know, when you're going into, I don't know, I, you know, I'm just naming names rather than who you've worked with, but, you know, Azizi or a coat or whoever it is, mm. and, you know, what, what's your advice for them? What, what's their starting point for rejigging the menu in terms of balance and what you think customers are after now, what, where, where do they start? Good question, actually, because um, obviously everyone's different and everyone has an agenda mm. that they've got within, you know, their business. A lot of the big firms come from stats. You know, it's all about what is, um, what do we need to do more of? Mm. So then you kind of start, some people start like that. Like, okay, people are asking for this. Or we're selling more. Actually, a lot of the time it's like, we're selling more of this, so let's do more of it. Mm. I'm like, okay, that's fine. It's not always the answer, though. Yeah. Sometimes the answer is, look at the environment around you. Like, what's happening? Mm. That doesn't necessarily mean look at someone else, but it's like, what's happening around you? How are people... Um, eating now mm. How, what are they what are they what are they reacting against you know and look at it that way yeah. but inevitably what happens is it's always around sales mm. you know you know this as well as I do that it's if the numbers fit then therefore the development will be guided that way mm. you know um, we, we talked recently about uh, you know some big companies that wanted to do stuff and it's about well we want to do, oh, small plates are cool. Let's do small plates. Mm. Yeah, small plates are cool, but they don't always stack up number-wise. Yeah. Not everyone um, wants to pay for small plates. Because yeah. if your environment is not conducive to a small plate environment, and mm. it's not you know, a bar with food, with uh, drinks, co- cool cocktails or whatever, mm. small plates are not going to work. Yeah. You, know, you need to have the entire piece. So someone coming to you and saying, yeah, we sit, we're under, we really we know that small plates are being cool is cool right now. I'm just taking that as an example, but yeah. that's cool right now. Let's do it. Yeah. No, it's not going to work. Mm. It's not going to work in your business. So you've got to, and I think sometimes when you're in the business, you don't see your business yeah. as well yeah. as someone else coming in. Yeah. So hopefully, what I try and bring to it is that this kind of you know that consumer view that we were talking about is that can I see it from your consumer, mm. and then can I see it as a chef? or a development chef. And I think if it, if it becomes gimmicky, or also, 
you know, going always going back to your brand, revisit mm. your brand, your brand values, yeah. what you stand for, and you know, where are your origins? Because yeah. you know, a lot of restaurants, not everyone, of course, but they're pigeonholed in a mm. country somewhere. Mm. So you know, play into that a bit more as well. Yeah. But but I think you know the chat certainly lately. If you think about all the the chains and stuff, you know, just. Joe Schmo in the pub or, you know, around or people that I know that are not in the industry, you know, ZZ keeps being talked about. They're like, wow, they've got a, mm. an actual menu for me and things. And it's even small, big things like that, that yeah. at least someone might not even order it. But again, mm. they know the they, yeah. they know that the thing's there, which is, we, which that, is really cool. That, when we're talking about trends and stuff, yeah, we know vegan is a massive trend. Mm. Um, and so... You know, everyone's now got a vegan, separate vegan menu, or vegetarian mm. menu, or a gluten-free menu. Carlitos did a gluten-free menu years ago. Mm. They were one of the first people to put a gluten-free menu out there, you know, or alternatives. But then, the, but then the big thing is, if, if you go so early, mm. you need to make sure that you get the credit for it now. Yeah. Whereas I think you are someone like ZZ, I think it was them anyway, you know, mm. they've, they've just hit that perfect storm yeah. where... It's in everyone, and then people have noticed. So, yeah. for someone like Carluccio's, you know, they've probably not got the credit they deserve. No, they probably they, you know? they they didn't because it probably got lost in the fact that they were probably ahead of the curve at yeah. the time. But then actually, like you know, yeah, okay, but oh, look, it's easy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? It's like okay, but Carluccio's did do it. And they'll, be, they'll be just quietly yeah. raging yeah. The, the and that's why I think Wagamama is getting the recognition for doing a, a vegan menu now but where people were doing it before mm. but Wagamamas are getting it now because yeah. they're working with certain people yeah. and to make it really really prevalent if you go yeah. to their noodle lab they're doing great things in there yeah. so and even actually you know to be fair to them they've followed it through every touch point so mm. uh, I had a Wagamama delivery last night yeah. um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, it, on the delivery menu, first thing you get, yeah. uh, well, there's a package deal, and then underneath that, first thing is yeah. vegan options. And I just think when a brand follows it through like yeah. that, you just think, oh, hats off, man, well done. But what's really cool about when brands do stuff like that, mm. they're understanding that their customer wants to feel special, yeah, you know, and they want to feel individual because everything's well, there's a there's a reaction against mass mm. food and mass market. So to make, to, even with a brand that's that big, yeah. to make people feel individual yeah. and special, I think it's really important. Yeah. And you can do that for food. Yes. Yeah. food is very personal. I mean, I just, yeah, Wagabam are just nailing it at every, oh, at yeah. every turn, you know. They you are just, the brand that everyone's talking about. Yeah. They're, they're just doing so great. And mm. contrary to, you know, all the other people that are closing and stuff, yeah. they're just continuing to, yeah. that's, that's definitely a good strategy. Yeah. So then, yeah, just the, the the last thing then, and I know you need to scoot, is mm. um, was just thinking about the, you know, the pop-ups that are all happening kind of everywhere. So Rose's Thai, Crosstown Donuts, Veggie Prep, da, 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 you know, all these kind of things. What's your view on those? Is it gimmick or is it good? <laughs> <laughs> pop-ups, goodness me. There are so many pop-ups. Mm. I mean... When I said it before, it was a struggle to get people on bums on seats in your pop-up. Yeah. It really is. It yeah. doesn't matter what outwardly people think. So when someone does a pop-up, it's just a test. Mm. They're just trying to test, them. They're trying to test an idea. Yeah. You know, I think you can effectively... Te- I mean, the reason they say pop-up is because they want to stand out mm. amongst their own customers. Yeah. You know? Oh, we did a pop-up. So mm. we want to be noticed. Mm. And the, the problem is that their, their headlines and the press still just pick up on those things. Mm. Well, how are doing a test kitchen? Mm. Uh, yeah, well, right. Well, why can't you just test dishes for your own customers? Mm. You know, there is a realm for pop-ups. Mm. There are people who are doing pop-ups out there, yeah. but they're genuinely new concepts. Well, what's interesting is, you know, there's a couple of things. One is that, you know, the pop-ups and the labs and all these, a lot of the time, not all of them, but a lot of the time, it's actually because that site isn't working. Yeah. So, you know, the marketing yeah. team or whoever it is, they're all sitting there going, what could we do, what could we do? Oh, pop up. Yeah. But Charles Dunstan of Carphone Warehouse yeah. and, and Five Guys and that, mm. he said something great. Mm. Um, I remember him saying this and he said, if you do something first, you're doing it for the customer. Mm. If you do something second, 
you're doing it for yourself. Yeah. And I hope that was the right the right person in the right quote, but that, that's what was told. <laughs> but that to makes me. sense. And I, I thought that was such a wonderful thought because actually, you know, like Pret, they they did they were the big one to kind of go out and do yeah. something like yeah. that. And you know, they genuinely meant and the, you know, they were talking about that even when I was there, mm. you know, and mm. it was years in the in the making. But you know, a lot of these other ones, it is just that site needs a boost. That site needs a launch. Yeah. That site's not working. Let's do a veggie pop up. You but, know, and, but on the, on the, uh, in terms of the prep thing, mm. I thought that was brilliant. Yeah, I thought that was inspired. Yeah, you know, I and it made a lot of sense for that site because that site was the one that sold the most vegan veggie stuff. Yeah, and they kind of went, actually, hold on, we're selling, we're outselling certain things. Yeah, we're outselling meat on this site. Yeah, so yes, that site probably there might have been failings on that site, but actually it was in an environment in Soho where there are a lot more veggie places opening up. Yeah. And, you know, you've got Hearst around the corner, you've got, you know, people, they had a consumer base, so it made sense to do that. The fact that it's now rolling out across other sites in areas that are, you know, vegan heavy, as yeah. it were, um, or vegan-centric, um, completely makes sense. It's just a, it's just a kind of follow-on from what they're doing. But that was inspired, I yeah. thought. And from a marketing point of view, it was bold. Yeah. It was the right way of doing it. If you're going to do it, do it the way they did it. Yeah. Don't do it half-heartedly. Yeah, just with a new, a yeah. new menu for like a few weeks. Yeah, for a few weeks, yeah. and I oh, will just do it. It's a pop-up. No, do it. Do it properly. Yeah, Jay, I'm going to need to let you run. Thank you. Be late for your next meeting. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, it's just to say, thanks so much for coming in. Um, I did have a question about future trend. No, I didn't. I wasn't. Um, <laughs> Flexitarianism. <laughs> yeah, <that's, laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think actually there's probably a case for us doing another chat. We've got a lot soon, to talk about. Um, because we haven't even covered the protein, lab-grown burgers, yeah. Instagram stuff. Yeah. yeah, so probably we could do a part, part two, two if you could be bothered. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll sort that out. The sequel. Out. Yeah, so... <laughs> Um, Jay, just one more plug for Great Guns. Yeah, so Great Guns Social until the 16th, and then we've got a brunch on the 17th, which is a big blowout brunch. Yeah. But 16th, um, just check my Insta, which is Chef Jay Majaria, across all social platforms or www.jmajaria.com. And it's Great Guns Social in Southwark, so just come along, book online. And that's till 16th of March. 16th of March, and there's a couple of restriction dates on there, but yeah. you know, just my Insta's always updated in terms of dates, so yeah. Yeah. He's one of the most uh, Instagram-friendly chefs that I've ever met. With the least amount of followers. (laughs) (laughs) Quality, not quantity. It's quality, it's quality. Jay Marajir, thanks so much. Um, And yeah, we'll catch up soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, man. There you have it. Just great to catch up with a new friend rather than an old friend this time. And just learning lots from him about the plant forward movement, about being plant curious and about also what you can do in your business to make a start to give customers what they really want. I'd like to thank Jay for his time. We could have spoken for two, three, four hours. We'll definitely have a return leg and do something maybe nearer in the summer. Don't forget Great Gun Social and Jay's pop-up is there until March 16th down at Southwark Bridge Road. Do get down there if you can, if you're lucky enough to get a booking, and do let us know how it was. A couple of things for Jay then. If you want to follow him on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, it's Chef J Morjaria. Chef J Morjaria, so it's M-O-R-J-A-R-I-A. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I'll speak to you next week, if not before.